Uh, give it about five more seconds, make sure the recording is going. Uh, good evening, everyone. We have about 48 people on this call. This is our third hybrid reopening meeting. Um, of course, in full transparency, as you probably heard in the news, there is uh, uh, another type of uh, press conference, news update, something like that happening right now as well. Um, I honestly know very little about it, Ms. Jenkins probably as well, because we were so focused on making sure we had everything, every minute that passes, we are finalizing more details for hybrid reopening. It is, it is the focus of all of our efforts right now, but we of course will find out more um, from the news and from internally from CPS in, in the next couple of hours. Uh, we, we actually honestly considered rescheduling this because what if, what if we don't um, do things according to, to plan, um, but we realize that regardless of what happens in the next few hours or in the next couple of days, all of the, at least 90 some percent of the information we're sharing tonight is going to be relevant um, at some point, right? COVID is not going away anytime soon. So whether we are all vaccinated before we return or something, if CPS and CTU change course and we don't open on February 1st, we're still going to be wearing masks at some point. We're still going to be very, having to be very safe with our arrival and our dismissal and all of the safety protocols you'll hear about tonight. Um, so, without further ado, uh, Ms. Jenkins, do you want to give the quick overview of tonight? Ms. Jenkins, do you want to? Do you want to? Share yes, I will. Yeah, uh, thank you. Oh, I, it seems like we have a bit of a delay. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. I feel like it's. Yes, it's probably the no. It's probably the snow. Can you hear me now? Yes. Tracking? Okay, good. Sorry, everyone. Um, so um, thank you for joining us. We appreciate your time, especially right now, knowing that you also want to be seeing what's going on with CPS. Um, so if you do find the need to switch away, we are recording the call, as Mr. Graves said, so you'll be able to still get this information. This is our third town hall. So we're going to try not to repeat too much of the information that we mentioned to you before um, and just kind of add additional, an additional layer to the information that you already have. But also, so you're aware, I know that it's hard to keep uh, track of all of this information. So we are also trying to think of the best way to create a way for you to access the information um, in a, maybe a, a link to kind of a flip book or something like that. So we, we are trying to meet that need for you because I know you don't want to have to watch three recordings to get the answer to your question. And as I mentioned in the last town hall, um, you are also welcome to email us. So if you think it's a question that we answered already, we understand it's a lot of information and I'm happy to answer the question again. So don't, don't feel like, ah, oh, I should just watch the video. You should if you haven't watched it, but if you just have a quick question, feel free to email us, okay? So today we want to just talk through um, the safety procedures, uh, the school day, and the school day not in like a day in the life of the student, but the logistics that we've added to the school day um, to help you see how we're thinking through that and then scheduling, obviously, an opportunity for you to ask questions and or comment um, after that, okay? And just a quick, important, very important thank you. We just want to say thank you. All of our staff um, at LaSalle working remotely, burning the candle at both ends to, uh, to prepare lessons. You know, this, yes, everyone is at home, but that does not make anything easier, right? Everything is more challenging because we're having to reinvent everything we do. That thank you to staff extends to all of you CPS staff who are on this call, who are, we have many LaSalle parents who are teachers and other um, educational professionals around the city. So thank you for all what you do as well. Many of you have been in touch with us during this time, sharing your plans and your ideas from your schools, whether they be CPS or private schools and whatnot. Families, thank you. Um, you're, you're pulling double, triple duty at time at home, right? Not just teaching your child, but, but serving as uh, an instructional assistant or teacher yourself. Um, uh, parenting your child, supervising, uh, and trying to juggle everything. And, and we know that that is a monumental task. So thank you. We have many healthcare professionals in our community and frontline workers. Healthcare professionals, we know that you've been um, the most at risk um, at the, you know, since the beginning of this pandemic. Thank you for everything you do. Frontline workers, we, we pass you in society all the time, right? Whether we're at grocery stores or 
um, gas stations or restaurants getting our carry out. And um, you know, Ms. Jenkins and I just today were working with a couple of volunteers and so much of volunteering is, is so different right now, right? There's a little bit in person when we have some things that can be done in the safest way as possible, but so much of the volunteering that we have from uh, our, 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 our community is, is in a very different way right now, but we still persevere, right? There are things that have to be done on annualized schedules um, and fundraising and things like that that we absolutely need in different ways. So thank you to everyone for all you're doing. Can't say it enough. All right, so we'll get started with the safety procedures and safety protocols that we have in place. Um, that looks okay. Um, so, as you know, um, students, staff, anyone in the building will be wearing masks. Um, and so, I wanted to mention um, that it's going to be an issue sometimes with students we know be, um, taking off their masks, but it's critical that you work with your child at home right now to kind of help them build up. Um, stamina, as they call it, to be able to wear that mask because um, outside of uh, lunchtime, um, they be mask wearing. And if an issue kind of arises with a student kind of learning the habit, we'll be reaching out to you um, to talk about what the best uh, learning mode is for um, a child. But hopefully, we can really get everyone into the habit of the mask. It's a challenge. We understand. It's a challenge for us as well. Um, so we understand that. So we'll certainly reach out to you before it becomes an issue. Um, and also, everyone should receive three cloth face coverings from CPS. They're blue with um, a white edging. So students will receive those and then you can uh, wash those at home and reuse them. Or of course, send your own mask. Students can wear the mask that you have at home. And um, so inside of every classroom now, I mentioned to you before, I think is hand sanitizer. So as students move from in and out of classrooms, in and out of washrooms, in and out of different rooms, there's hand sanitizer installed at child height for them to be able to use the help along with the hand washing, obviously. And then all classrooms now have um, an air purifier in them. Those arrived last week. And uh, I mentioned the mask at all times except during lunchtime. And that includes recess. And um, although we are playing with the idea of a, a non-mask area to give kids individually a break from the mask, but that is still um, in discussions with CPS to see where that what that looks like safely. So we're still looking at the guidance for that. And then lastly, this is the most important one. This is actually going to take up about three screens, I think, is the health screener. So we had NWEA testing last week. I think last week is all coming running together now. Um, and we had about 80, was it 45 to 80 students come in through testing total, right? So an issue, we said, this is a great time to use as a tester for how things will go once students come back to school. Um, and the, an issue that we came up with across was the health screener. So it's on cps.edu. Um, you have to do the health screener with your child before they leave the house because they cannot enter the building until we've checked the health screener. So it's really, really uh, important to our entry process that the health screener is permitted. What we want to do once we've checked the health screeners, then obviously continue with the temperature checks um, at the door. Next slide. So um, this has to happen. It opens at 4 a.m. I know that someone asked a question. You can receive a text from CPS. People were asking, well, how do I get that text? You would have to have signed up. You will have heard from our clerk by now. You would have had to have signed up in Aspen to receive um, text from CPS. So if you say yes, that you will receive text, you sign the slip that you will receive it, then you will get a health screener text every morning from CPS to fill out the health screener. If you don't have that, that's perfectly fine. Just go to cps.edu slash health screener. I put it as a uh, bookmark on my phone. Um, and if a student fails the health screener, um, they, um, they can not enter the building. Or if they've entered the building, they'll be in a waiting area for you to come back and pick them up. So if you know at home that your child failed the health screener, please do not bring them to school because they're actually not allowed to be in school that day. Um, next screen. Uh, Ms. Jenkins, I can add too, with the automatic notification, right? I, I'm assuming like a lot of you, like that's something I thrive from. Like I set calendar alerts for myself and things like that. It comes automatically from CPS, as Ms. Jenkins said, if you've opted in. A number of families have automatically opted in because you, you are the families who 
filled out the form in years prior to get like robocalls and auto messages. Okay. Not just my child is absent auto messages, but like if I were to send out an, you know, breaking news. So we're going to test that system tomorrow to see if you get it or not. And we're going to start calling some families, um, but we're not going to get through everybody. Right. So I might do something where like, if you receive it, fill out this Google form, something like that, but I'm also going to include it in tomorrow's newsletter as well. So if you don't receive an alert from me, when I tell you to, then you can fill out the form. It's cumbersome. I hate it. You have to fill out a paper form and either mail it to us or bring it in. But the nice thing is um, it only affects the families who are sending their children back, right? You don't need to do the health screener if your child is at home every day. <laughs> um, so if you just send it with your child on the first day of school, we can enter them that day and then you'll start getting alerts hopefully by the next day. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Um, if your child arrives off a health screener, then we have to call you to actually come back and complete it. Um, so please do that before you leave the house. And if you forget that, then certainly before you get out the car so that um, it's done. And then as soon as they get to the door, we can more easily pull them up. The reason we need it done, honestly, as early as possible is we could just print out the sheets and very quickly check them off. Otherwise we have to um, pull it up, which we're happy to do. But if we have to stop doing that to actually enter them in the health screener, then that slows down the process tremendously. All right, a little more about safety. I mentioned signage before, we'll stay on that. We do have signs um, to remind students about social distancing. We certainly need your support with that. Students, uh, we also notice this during NWEA, they miss each other. They miss each other a lot. And so please have a nice chat with your child this weekend, if we're coming back Monday, about social distancing. Just a reminder, and then they'll get reminders from us just until they get into the habit of being able to see their friend, but also not be able to, um, you know, wrestle or you know even just hug so um and then i want to talk about the care room so every school now has what's called a care room we actually have two we have a backup care room as well so if we're in in the midst of the school day and a child is showing symptoms of uh, COVID, now this is separate from having to see the nurse because they you know cut their arm or something but if they're showing actual COVID symptoms we do have a room and an attendant in that room um, called the care room and the attendant is the CRA. So if a child is showing symptoms, they'll um, escort um, the student from their classroom to the care room. They actually do have an outfit on very similar to that uh, without the hood. <laughs> but um, so we'll then contact you immediately um, for you to pick your child up. And obviously we strongly recommend a COVID test at that um, Point. If there's something goes further than that um, and it winds up being um, COVID, then we'll talk about the process that the pod would then go through. So one big thing, as we all know, in terms of just kind of keeping ourselves safe and, and during COVID is making sure that we're hand washing and sanitizing our hands. I mentioned that before, that entry points are a really big uh, place to sanitize. So we have really um, hand sanitizing stations at every entry point, and we recommend that you, again, talk with your child this weekend, talk about, you know, using those, not just walk, when they walk in the building, they're at every entrance, they're at every classroom entrance, they're by the bathrooms. And so it's not just even entry and exit, but they feel like they touch some things and then they can't get to the bathroom to watch them in every moment during a school day to certainly utilize those sanitizing stations. And the cleaning procedure. So we're, we, have, we have a pretty stringent cleaning schedule. Um, happening, especially high touch areas. Um, and also we use disinfectant spray um, at nighttime and Wednesdays, we're doing deep clean. So we're potting Monday, Tuesday, deep clean Wednesday. Then the second pot comes in Thursday, Friday. That's why the Wednesday is all remote. But also if a student becomes ill in a classroom, um, or has uh, signs of COVID in a classroom, that classroom specifically will get that deep clean as soon as um, we are able to move the class to a different room. And again, about the health screener, if your child fails the health screener, unless they're too ill to actually have class, they can still participate in remote learning that day. Just reach out to us, okay? Because what we can do is we can't, let's say a kid is sick Tuesday, they can't switch and come in on Thursday. They have to stay in their pod. But if they uh, fail the health screener, then still do have them sign on so they can participate in the learning that day. If they can't and they're too ill to participate, then call the office and report it as an illness, as a sick day. And so I put, um, you know, I realized I don't know if 
I put this, I don't know if people have this information because you'd have to go onto the CPS website to get it. If your child shows symptoms of COVID, we don't report that. You know what I mean? That's a personal health issue. We're actually not allowed to. You, you have to report it for your own. Um, but we do stress that the importance of contact tracing. So if you do, if your child does show um, that they have COVID, they test positive for COVID, please do reach out to the cps.edu um, or the contact tracing at CPS um, website so that we can uh, contact trace and make sure that everyone is safe and you know trying to keep one another safe. Now, as I mentioned before, CPS is doing the contact tracing. We are not. So Mr. Graves and I are doing it. Um, so you, if you let them know, they'll be reaching out to you and to everyone in the pod. So there's a, at some point they'll let us know. And even when we do communicate that information, we never use student names. We won't use family names. We'll just say someone in the pod. We might, probably wouldn't even mention it if it's, if it's a teacher or if it's a student. We just would say the pod. I can, I can read you the exact wording from an email we recently received. It's, it's vague enough that I'm not revealing anything confidential here. It says, to help prevent the spread of COVID-19, the district has established a 10-person contact tracing team, which investigates all known cases of COVID in district schools. So even that part alone, like Ms. Jenkins said, it, it's contingent on you reporting that your child has it, right? Just you calling me to say, uh, or Ms. Soria to say that your child is at home because they tested positive for COVID, we should be responding to you by saying thank you for notifying us. Um, if you are willing to, please follow the contact tracing process so that all others can be notified. We are not able to share that information on your behalf. Then it says, working in close coordination with the Department of Public Health, the district's contact tracing team notifies all close contacts and ensures that proper notifications are sent to each school community in a timely manner. Okay. okay, next slide, yes. Yes, thank you. And then I thought this was interesting and some people may be interested in um, tracing the information. It's just that there is actually, now this is of course reported cases. Um, so there is information on the website in case you're interested in the details of reported cases. All right, so if a student dis displays symptoms, again, this is on the CPS website, but I just thought um, you wanted to know what's happening there. So if a staff member or a student displays symptoms um, of COVID, um, then obviously we'll go through the contract tracing um, issues of reaching out to them. We certainly recommend that you get um, a COVID test. If, it, if you're having an issue and can't figure that out, CPS will help you with that. So, okay, so don't feel like you don't know what to do in that situation if you reach out. Uh, we'll help you. We'll help you figure out how, to, where, and how to get that testing done. But we certainly recommend that. Obviously, even if you're tested, but you have the symptoms, or um, your child, I mean, has the symptoms, and there is, we recommend the 10 calendar days. Um, even if you don't get the COVID test, but you have the symptoms. So if you get a confirmed case, stay out the 10 days. Um, if you don't get tested, then still you have to do the self quarantine. So you have to be fever free for 24 hours and but we can talk details on a case by case basis, okay? And now let's talk about the logistics of the school, not the school days and the hours um, and specific life in the student, but just kind of things that will be going on in the school day and how we'll move around the school. So a little bit different than last, last year, obviously. Last year, families arrived any old time um, at 8.30. The kids played on the playground and just kind of hung out. Bigger kids were dropped off or walked or caught the bus. Little ones, uh, parents usually stay with them for a little while. And then um, the Sikas um, will go outside and do playground supervision. There is no supervision before school this year. So please do not arrive on the school grounds before 845. And even when you arrive, students um, need to go to their designated line area. So we're not using the playground as a kind of playground morning recess kind of situation this year. This year we need everyone to go to their designated line area so that we can maintain proper social distancing. So I'll give you a schedule in a slide or two so you can see what time that is. We do have a staggered schedule. So um, we need students to proceed to their line very close to their staggered schedule time so that we can begin the health screens and begin entry times. All right, and you'll have an assigned entry time. Um, if you arrive, after the entry time, then students will wait still at their designated entry area 
once we finish the next group, then we'll pull students in. Um, and also, if it's inclement weather, still be careful. Do not arrive too early because students can't just walk into the building to wait for inclement weather. They still have to go through the health screening entry process. So um, we will not be available to do that earlier. So 845 is the soonest that we can start the process. So here's a schedule. Originally, I put tentative, and then I took that off because the truth is this is pretty solid, um, I think, for us as a schedule. Please leave us a little leeway. We might have to make a change here or there, but for the most part, this is our, our staggered entry schedule. And you'll get um, something individual for your grade level, a little map of where your entry door is and your time. Okay, so if in the staggered time re is reflected in the dismissal time as well. So kindergarten and through second grade, kinder's gonna come in through the kinder door. 101 will line up along their window. I mean, 100 will line up along their window. 102 will line up along the gate in that kinder area. Now when kinder arrives and first grade um, and second, really parents, I know you usually stay with your students, but this year we do ask that if you arrive earlier than then the door entry time, please stay with your student to help ensure the social distancing and then the doors entry will start around 910. It may start a little bit earlier than that, but 910 is their entry time. Third and fourth grade, we don't need parents to stay necessarily, but we also don't need students to arrive um, too much earlier than their actual arrival time. Third and fourth is on the regular school day schedule of nine o'clock to four o'clock. So as soon as they arrive, you can drop them off, but they need to proceed to their designated line area, which will actually be third grade is going to go to the main door. Fourth grade is going to be back at the Sedgwick door, lined up in social distance. And fifth through eighth grade, interesting, we actually made a change today. Uh, we're going to have um, fifth grade and sixth grade, they're going to line up where they always, where we kind of put them, which is at the Willow door which is the door they've never used before. That's actually the teacher's entry door. So they'll line up at the Willow door and then it will, the line will proceed towards Orleans and then north, north, yeah, north on Orleans um, in, in designated, in um, social distance lines. Seventh and eighth grade will line up in the gym. So they will come to the gym door. Uh, we're marking off um, sections for them today. So, and then bus students, they actually would just go to their designated line area. But if the bus arrives early, because you can't control a bus, sometimes it comes early, sometimes it comes late, you know that. If they arrive early, uh, we also have a place for them. So they will also proceed to the Sedgwick door and we have a designated uh, line area for them as well at the Sedgwick door, okay? I just want to point out, like, I think this slide perfectly encapsulates, like, the challenges of all the logistics, right? Like, no matter how good or bad any school district's plans for hybrid reopening are, these are the types of logistics that are going to be individualized to the to each of the 500 schools in CPS, right? Um, we got lucky, for example, that our fence posts outside <laughs> are six feet apart. So as we will be, you know, the first... As many of you that will teach your children the procedures we're talking to you tonight about are, are is great, but there are going to be you know several dozen that do not. So we're going to have a plan in place on the first day to make sure that all of the staff that are outside greeting students and lining them up in each of these three waves of student entries at 8.50, 9 o'clock, and 9.10 are teaching students this is where you stand, don't get too close. We're gonna have flyers to give kids so that it very clearly describes for the, the big enough kids, the little kids are gonna be with you. So we're asking for your cooperation on that. All of these little moving parts, it, it's not gonna work like clockwork, right? But it's going to be safe. We have enough adults in place to help make sure that this is a smooth enough process on the first couple of days and every day we'll work through kinks. Yeah, we, we made the, the original plan. I was telling Mr. Grace, we made the original plan. It was like late September, the chief and I stood outside. Well, I remember now, it was late September. No, we didn't have on jackets. We had this great plan about spray painting the ground. And then today I was like, okay, so that plan's out the window. <laughs> What's the new plan? So we're still trying to figure out last minute on a, on a weather day like today, how can kids social distance? So That'll be tomorrow's challenge. <laughs> All right, and then breakfast, again, a little bit different. It's gonna be grab and go, but it won't be completely different. But what's gonna happen now is as students enter through their designated areas, um, a lot of them will be able to grab it and walk straight upstairs. Seventh and eighth grade will grab um, bags, 
as well, fourth grade. So even though they're coming in the Cedric door or the gym or whatever, at some point on their path will be their, their breakfast table to grab and go up to their classrooms. And same for lunch. The only ones who won't be doing the grab and go breakfast at a hallway table will be kinder. Theirs will be delivered to their room because I think we all know why <laughs> kinder's gonna you know drop some of them drop everything in the hallway as soon as they take three steps so we definitely want to try to support them as best we can this will be first grade's first time grabbing breakfast to go usually they are delivered to the classroom so we're going to have to do some scaffolding there we do kind of work it through a backup plan if it's too early for first grade but we're going to give it a shot all right, visitors, this first line is very important. Normally, you know, we're happy to see you. We, we know that it's a, the morning time is a great time to, you know, get a little business done um, in the school. Why drop the kids off, go to the office, deliver this, ask questions about that. We can't do that this year. We cannot have visitors during um, dismissal, I mean, during entry because it's just entry is gonna be a, a challenge in and of itself. So there will not, parents and guardians will not be able to enter the building during entry or dismissal. So we have to really focus on that as an entire staff. It's definitely gonna take the entire village to make entry and dismissal a success. So we are wanna continue reaching out to teachers through email, reaching out to the clerk through emails and phone calls. And that includes dismissal as well. We're not gonna have, normally we have some perfect time to chat with a teacher, ask a few questions. We are asking that we do not have those conversations anymore with teachers at the end of the day, um, because well, a lot of them anyway are gonna get to some virtual classes immediately after dismissal, but also please continue just for safety reasons to email teachers, set up Google Meets. So while the students are in person, we are asking that parent and teacher communication uh, continue to be virtual transportation so if you're ha if your student is um, on the bus then you probably have already received communication from the bus uh, company um, if not you will be so the bus um, company reaches out they handle most of that they will do um, health screeners still at school but they'll check temperatures on the bus they'll be social distance on the bus um, and then I think that's everything. If there are issues with the bus, they'll talk with email Miss Ria, our clerk. She handles all of that information. Restrooms. We're going to have a schedule for restrooms to keep students safe. But of course, as I said before, students can use the bathroom throughout the day uh, without outside of the restroom schedule. But that's where the washing of the hands and then using the hand sanitizer is important because they'll be on a our, our custodians will be on a cleaning schedule. So if your student goes outside of their scheduled time, then bathrooms won't necessarily be cleaned in between their pods. So make sure washing hands and using hand sanitizers. Our goal is to make that a, a very um, a very common habit among the students. Water fountains. So that's not our water fountain. That's a different school, but I took their picture because it was already <laughs> on the slide. So, but ours are covered up with a little orange bag and it's just, we're no longer using water fountains, but we have water bottle dispensers at, we're all at each fountain. So please send your student with a filled water bottle every day. Um, and then they can also refill the water bottle um, throughout the day. But, and then we'll have something in place. Obviously if a student forgets their water bottle, Obviously, uh, my custodian and I are like talking through the best way to do it. Do we keep a cup there? But they have to stand right by there to finish the cup. But our recommendation is that you bring a filled water bottle. And if you want to donate any water bottles to students, um, feel free. We can certainly um, help out with that as well. And that's a picture on the bottom of our new tech guy. Uh, this I use this uh, power this slide this PowerPoint with the teachers as well, and I wanted them to meet them. So that's Michael. We don't have a designated day yet, unfortunately, for our technology, but um, we will be able to get him in on Fridays um, as we can, as we um, need. So we're very excited that we received our final delivery. I think from CPS. So they delivered last week iPads, Chromebooks. This week they deliver. Uh, power strips, cameras, speaker phones, and headphones to help us do simultaneous teaching as effectively as we can. So that's exciting for us. And also make sure that uh, students coming into the building, they will be using CPS devices only. You cannot bring personal devices from home. So if you're doing um, hybrid and you don't have a CPS device, then we'll be assigning your child a CPS device. 
I also want to point out, we just had a major technology upgrade at LaSalle, um, bandwidth update, I should say. Um, we have yet to test it with a number of students, right? We did, I mean, I will say successfully, we had 30 students very socially safely distanced uh, taking the NWEA test in the gym. And we, we have at times had bandwidth issues during NWEA. We had no issues at all with bandwidth during NWEA. Yeah, that's usually around. the big tester yeah. of the NWEA. Like, it's dropping off, it won't load. We didn't have one issue with that. I think well, they know. They we also just today got um, some uh, bandwidth like recommendations. Like if you're experiencing bandwidth issues at school, try A, B, C, D, E, F, G on each device. And so we have a backup plan, but I'm really not anticipating that bandwidth, even with a bunch of devices streaming Google Meets, I don't anticipate it being a significant issue. No, um, the truth is our bandwidth, they upgraded us, but they didn't just like bring us up to speed. They actually gave us additional bandwidth to grow towards. So I think we'll be fine. Honestly, I'm excited to see, but I think we'll be perfectly fine. Um, just a little snapshot um, of a classroom. So obviously what we did was we, we're moving furniture out as we can. You'll see a, a, a very unattractive um, tractor uh, trailer in the <laughs> parking lot. Oh, we get that painted. <laughs> but right now it's a big rusty trailer, but we're gonna put uh, furniture in there as, as we can. We moved, ro rolled up the rugs and put them in, in my old office. And um, we're gonna try to get as much space in the classrooms as we can, but still have them be engaging and, and fun for students to be in as best we can. Uh, I think I mentioned this last time. Students won't be switching um, classrooms. Like they're not going to travel from math to science to reading. Teachers will switch instead. Same for essentials teachers as well. And if you missed the last uh, town hall, language is going to be remote still. We just could not make the numbers work in order of keeping everyone safe because they see too many students. So we kept uh, language remote. Same. So essentials, now I put this, but I should have put a star by it about in terms of essentials having the same class for five weeks. Um, but the goal is to find the best way to um, keep teachers and students safe. Um, Mr. Grace, feel free to weigh in, that, uh, in on that with essentials in the five weeks. Um, but the essentials teachers will push into the classrooms themselves, so they're not going to go to the library. Unfortunately, that's never fun, but what can you do? You know, the library is a great place to be for kids, but we have to put safety first. And so the librarian will push into classrooms and um, the art teacher will also push into classrooms. And in terms of your time, uh, remote students, you'll have the first 30 minutes with the teacher and then asynchronous for the second 30 minutes or the first half of the class and then asynchronous for the second half of the class. And then lunch, students will have um, lunch in their classrooms. We're still working out the schedule. I think it's pretty finalized. I didn't want to put up here and we make three changes tomorrow. But um, fine, because we're kind of, there's so many changes in terms of like staff changes and student changes that every day, whatever I've said, it's going to be changed to all of it slightly at least. The goal is to have at least one gym rotation out of the two days, but we'll see that's the, the goal is hopefully we can get them through um, the gym for a little bit more open space for um, lunch and then recess will be outside, but we'll talk about that in a second. All right, so outside of days like today when the snow kind of overtakes <laughs> our backyard, it, it did, it's, it, it's up to the door. So we couldn't, uh, we wouldn't have been able to use it on a day like today. But outside of the, the heavy snow days, we ha we'll have the backyard <laughs> sectioned off so that uh, one pod is in this side of the turf, one pod is on the west side of the turf, one pod is on this designated area of the asphalt, one in the garden, we might even use the kinder little garden area this year. So. Uh, but uh, when weather lets us, the weather lets us pretty easily. If it's um, at least 21 degrees or more, we go outside. And if it's obviously not raining um, or snowing too heavily, we go outside. So masks must be worn at all times. And then on inclement weather days, unfortunately, um, 
recess will be in their classrooms so they can still relax but obviously won't be as fun and it never is as fun as outside is for students but um, also no playground equipment at any point that playground equipment is is um, off limits same wise because we won't be able to clean it in between and dismissal. So students will be dismissed um, at their, as you saw earlier, their, their designated times. Please pick students up promptly. Um, again, we're not going to have after school um, playground time. Uh, we will not have supervision for the uh, playground time either. So please pick students up promptly. K-3, we do need an adult there to pick the students up. Fourth through eighth grade students, eighth are dismissed. So um, if you're picking your student up, please be there on time because we just dismissed fourth through eighth and then um, students are asked to immediately leave school grounds. And Mr. Graves, you wanna do the schedule? In a moment. <laughs> Mr. Graves is gonna talk you through the, the scheduling uh, models. Multiple devices, multiple <laughs> controls. Okay, so um, I will be uh, in full, uh, you know, Please wait in bated breath for a few more moments. I will show you what the master schedule looks like. Um, I wasn't sure if I'd have a visible version ready by tonight, but I'll show you that in a few minutes. So this is the general overview. Let's let's start big picture and let's hone in. I'm going to give you the audible version and then the visual version for the auditory and kinesthetic learners in our audience tonight. So general overview, all students will learn all subjects synchronously as they do now. Let's dispel of any um, horror stories, um, concerns that we have about um, uh, the, the at-home experience is going to be vastly different because your child is going to receive less instruction, things like that. There are going to be some changes. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it and make it sound like it's gonna feel exactly the same. Um, you, you may have seen some minutes in the guidance, this number of minutes of at-home synchronous learning and before there was more. I, I honestly do not care about those numbers. We have teachers at LaSalle that always, our teachers go above and beyond. The guidance says this, they do this in every aspect of what we do. That is our mission, that is who we are because we love your children and we want them to have the safest and best experience possible. So. Um, you'll see what it looks like, but I'm being honest that if your child is in school, they're going to receive all of their instruction directly from a teacher. If they're at home, they're going to receive their instruction directly from a teacher. Just like now, a mix of synchronous and asynchronous. Um, and if your child is at home, it will still be a significant portion of the day. We're not gonna like cut the day in half or anything like that. It's still gonna feel like for students in grades, two through eight, it's still gonna feel like a 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. day. And in, uh, in second grade, I know we've kind of shaved it, the synchronous time down a little bit. And then in K-1, we've, we've truncated the day a little more with some opt-in activities, small groups, assessments later in the day, but it's gonna feel similar to what it does now in terms of the scope of the day. Um, some subjects in some grade levels will be taught to only the hybrid or remote students at once. So there's this concept of simultaneous teaching, right, where the teacher is teaching the hybrid and remote students at the same time. I, we just got, as Ms. Jenkins said, the technology arrived today. So we were tinkering with it. What is the webcam like? What is this little UFO pod that's our speaker and our microphone? We set all that up. Um, it works. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be ideal. Simultaneous teaching is, is probably the most dreaded thing that we have to look forward to, but I'm not worried that our teachers cannot do it. It's just not going to be, um, you know, uh, as simple as we would think, and it's not going to look like what you might see, I don't know, maybe like a YouTube video or something like that. Um, let's see. Uh, some subjects, as it says here, um, some subjects in some grade levels will be taught simultaneously. Some, you'll, it'll be um, where the teacher is teaching just the hybrid kids and then just the remote kids. And you'll see what that looks like when I go grade level band by band. Language is all remote, as we said earlier. Wednesday is abbreviated. The, the day ends at 2 p.m. You may have heard in other schools, it's like 1 p.m. Well, with our additional time, instructional time that we have for language, we've extended our day. We want our students to continue to receive all their subjects and language is part of our core curriculum. Um, look, you know, there are so few logistics involved in remote learning, right? We're able to really maximize instructional time. 
But now that there's this potential shift back to hybrid instruction or in-person instruction of some kind, imagine being an in-person child coming into the building, you're taking off your, especially in this weather, boots, jackets, especially the little kids, even the big kids, you're eating breakfast. All of that has to happen between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. It's not like, oh, breakfast is before the day starts, right? Now the kids are coming back, those kids in person have all those logistics throughout the building, bathroom breaks, <clears throat> moving through the halls, at least at certain key times of the day. And as a result, your child at home is going to be affected by that, right? Because those are times that the teacher, now, now if teacher A is transitioning students through the hall while teacher B is teaching your child at home, great, you don't even, you're not even impacted by the logistics, but there are going to be times where they are, right? When the homeroom teacher is doing something and your child at home is supposed to be with the homeroom teacher, they may, you may have to wait patiently. The teacher may say, I'll be right with you all in a moment, or it might be asynchronous time. Um, which was already planned in the first place. So be prepared for that. It's gonna feel a little different, right? Because of all these logistics. And yes, we only have, I think approximately 113 students coming on any given day, Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, Friday. Everything takes longer, right? We are spacing our students out so far that it's like we have a giant long line of students and we have to, we can't just pass each other in the halls. We can't, you know, all the things we do, our, our hallways aren't that wide. So we have to be very particular about how we transition. And all of that is going to take a little bit longer, the bathroom breaks, things like that. Um, I am proud to say that as of this time, and still like after all of the readjustments we've had to make with all the moving targets of this, we, we are not planning on re-rostering any students. We know that that will be severely disruptive to all of you at home, new teacher, new students, new peers, new expectations, new way of teaching. None of that is fun and we want to keep all this in place. So let's talk through a day in the life of a K through first grade student. If your student is hybrid, uh, math and reading, and, and none of the, I say sample here, draft, whatever you want to call it, because you're going to hear the flyover from me and you're going to hear the specific details from your child's teacher. In first grade, for example, between Ms. Zarenko and Ms. Simon, they talk, they plan. It's going to have a similar feel, a similar vibe, similar expectations, but they're their own teachers. And we, we give our teachers autonomy because we, we, we know that they are well-prepared and well-planned and they run their plans by me and Ms. Jenkins. Um, but you will hear from Ms. Zarenko and Ms. Jenkins um, about the, the plans, or sorry, distracted, Ms. Zarenko and Ms. Simon for their, their plans for their classroom in particular. But for example, uh, math and reading instruction will be taught in half groups, kind of like they are now. So there's like the leopards and the giraffes. So while, one, while the teacher is teaching the in-person kids, the kids at home are working asynchronously. And then later it's the opposite way where uh, the teacher is teaching through the computer screen to the remote students and the in-person students are working either on their device or at their desk off their device with some manipulatives, tactile work, something like that, um, possibly with an assistant in the room or not. Um, and the teacher might have to be doing some double duty, keeping an eye on the kids, but interacting uh, in person, but keeping it, but interacting with kids on the computer screen. Social studies and science are, the teachers are at this point, at least most of them are planning on teaching simultaneously. So webcam, speaker, microphone, interacting kind of, you know, gesturing to the whole class, students at home watching them through the computer screen, but they're talking to the kids out loud. Um, and then as it says here, uh, when teacher is teaching core instruction to remote students, hybrid students are working independently off devices, like I just said, right? So now the remote students, let's flip that experience. Math instruction taught in half groups, like we just said. Social studies, science taught simultaneously. It's gonna feel a little different, but you're still live interacting with your teacher, right? When teacher is teaching core subject, core instruction to hybrid students, remote students are working asynchronously. Second through fourth grade is a little different. Um, once again, this is just a draft, just a sample. You will hear from your child's teacher, but this is one example of what it may look like. All homeroom subjects may be taught simultaneously. We may have students in, and there's a variety of reasons why, developmentally, supervisory, why this looks different than K-1. Um, all homeroom subjects may be taught simultaneously. So um, if students are in person, they might be simply on their device with headphones on looking at the computer screen 
while the teacher is teaching exactly like they are right now to all the students on the computer screen, not having to gesture at all because they're not looking at their students in front of them except to keep an eye on them and keep them supervised, but they're interacting with all students this way. Um, but that being said, I just spoke with one of the second through fourth grade teachers today and they said their goal is to maintain the feel of exactly what it's like right now with the entire flow of the day, all the students together in all the times they are right now. So, I mean, the times might have to be adjusted, but that same kind of flow, all the students together instead of half groups. Um, let's see, as it says there, um, at some point though, we dismiss the at-home students to work asynchronously as we do right now, right? Our teachers all have asynchronous time right now where they're working with small groups or independently. And right now, when we send the students at home to work independently, that's when they can interact with the students in person in different ways. They don't need to remain on devices at that point, right? They can walk, they can circulate, keep their distance. They can pull a student a little bit closer to where they are and work with them on something. They can look over a student's shoulder at a safe distance, things like that. Um, and that's about it. Fifth through eighth grade. Um, we're, we're tinkering with a couple of structures still, but the, as the numbers and the teachers that are reporting back are, are fluctuating still, um, understand that our numbers are now low enough in terms of who's coming back for hybrid that we can make one of our fifth grade homerooms without even having to change anything in Aspen. One of the homerooms would be the hybrid homeroom and the other one would be fully remote. So your child might be in a fully remote homeroom where they're always being taught remotely as they are now, if your child is remote. And if they're hybrid, it might be simultaneous where if your child is at home, they're still seeing the teacher and the kids interact and they're interacting with the kids, but the teacher is gesturing to the whole, the whole class, which is not necessarily diminished, right? It's just different. Um, but if they're in person, that's when they're interacting with the teacher. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's what that's gonna look like. Um, potentially. And you'll, you'll hear why things are up in the air a little bit more in a minute. I'm going to describe. Um, yeah, I think that's the gist of it. Essentials. Uh, as Ms. Jenkins said a little bit earlier, the, the timing may change, right? So the benefit is essentials right now is about 40 minutes per class. We've extended that to 60 minutes. We've had to cut out wind time. It's just um, wind time is, as I think somebody, uh, grades like fifth through eighth grade especially you're familiar with what that is right now it's just it's not possible in our new schedule for hybrid but the benefit is it's essentials time is longer now if you're an at-home student it might drop from 40 to 30 minutes but that's to be determined by the teacher it's kind of like if you experience language right now right if you know how our language teachers are doing things they have 60 minutes to use the guidance says that 40 or so minutes of that should be synchronous and the rest should be asynchronous. But as you know, in our, I pop into our language teachers' classrooms all the time. They love teaching and they generally go to 45, 50, 55 minutes and then say, oh, we're almost out of time. Make sure you do your Rosetta Stone, right? They love teaching and we love that our students are benefiting from that. So our essentials teachers may choose to do the same, but it is a challenge for them to have to teach the students through the computer screen and in person all at one time. So they might dismiss the students at home at some point to continue working independently while they can work on with their students in person. Um, yeah, and let's be honest, like gym in a classroom during inclement weather, because we can't really use the gymnasium, like gym class in the homeroom classroom, not going to be the, the greatest experience, but it will happen and students will still develop healthy physical habits as a result of it. Um, Wednesdays, so like we said, right, Wednesdays are going to end at 2 p.m. synchronously and then students completing assignments, activities asynchronously from 2 to 4. Um, it's important to point out we are still getting through all of our, in grades K through four, core subjects of math, reading, and language. Students will receive those, maybe social studies and science, but that's more of a teacher discretion because, you know, consider the minutes across the week, right? They might put more on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and then feel safe for cutting it on Wednesday, but they might be able to adjust it so the students receive it all, you know, um, all the days of the week. Just, it's a numbers game at some point, right? Because we, we only have so many minutes. But essentials are still taught on Wednesday because that's when our teachers get their prep periods. This is the, the last big slide to call out. Um, this is what we're dealing with right now, right? And this is, I think, the, the, the elephants multiple that have been in the room the entire meeting, um, the entire past several weeks. Um, and I think uh, 
you know, as it says here, um, what's going to happen, right? What's going to happen in these next couple of days? Um, uh, what decisions are going to be made between CPS and CTU? If you're, I, I'm, I'm kind of, kind of keeping an eye on Twitter while we're talking right now, but um, we know instruction will still be provided tomorrow remotely, right? We don't have pre-K or cluster, so our teachers are planning on working tomorrow remotely. We know there's a good chance that there may be a strike. Teachers may get blocked out on Thursday. None of that is within mine, Ms. Jenkins' control. Um, you know, we, we support our teachers. We care about them. We, we love your children, and we're, we're not going to let this complication, um, we're not going to let children suffer in, in long-term consequences, okay? Um, we're going to find solutions for this. You know you will hear from me. You will hear from CPS as, as things develop in the next couple days. Um, but let me go through a couple of these bullet points so, you, so we can at least make sure that you're aware of what we are still working on. It is a moving target across the whole city as to which staff will be returning. I just spoke to a staff member today who has uh, like an emerging personal need. And that's something that like their CPS may say deadlines, this is when you need to file your paperwork, but life doesn't work that way, right? So as people's needs and situations and realities are changing, so might our staff staffing. I care deeply about the safety of all of our staff and the safety of all of the family members of our staff and the childcare needs of all of our staff, right? If any of you as parents worked for us, I would be making the same accommodations and trying to work solutions out for you as well. So please understand that if you do not see a teacher in the building, if you hear that they're continuing to still work remotely, I, I'm, I'm insisting that none of us pass judgment on that, right? We respect the needs of all of our staff members. Um, all of our teachers, all of, I've spoken to almost every single one. We have about 70 staff members total. Every single person wants to be working. They want to be with your children. Some are terrified of this virus, which I completely understand. It's affected some of us way more significantly than others in our, in our personal lives and families um, and friends and, and neighbors and whatnot. And so that's, that's my, my most important ask is that we respect that if a teacher or staff member of some kind is continuing to work remotely, there is a very important reason for that, okay? Um, who is available to staff the building and in what ways? That's a moving target as well. Ms. Jenkins and I are very focused on logistics and making sure that, like I've said before, if your child arrives on February 1st, unless CPS completely shuts down, your child will be safe. They will be given a safe place to learn. I don't know if besides me, Ms. Jenkins and Mr. Autry, if we're going to have maybe, we have at least four other people that are scheduled to work, two uh, um, substitutes and two miscellaneous employees, but I don't know who we're going to have beyond that if there is a strike, but you know, this is about finding the best path forward um, in, in whatever form that is. Um, I think we're all optimistic that a crisis would be avoided and at least a number of our staff who are safe enough, safe enough, who feel safe enough, however the determination becomes, would report to work if there's no strike, like I said, and then we would be able to put a structure in place. And Ms. Jenkins and I have planned for a number of scenarios, you know, depending on which staff. Which rooms? We've, we have an entire spreadsheet of which, well, this staff member is going to have to move there. We want to make sure that, for example, our language classrooms, we don't, need to worry about their size because it's going to be just the teacher by themselves, right? But think about our special education rooms. Some of them are very small and we don't want a teacher with like five students in a very small room. So we've moved things around. So now that this teacher with these four students are in this larger classroom. Um, grading, right? Grading ends, the, the quarter ends on um, next Thursday, Friday is the end of the quarter. I don't have answers yet as to what it's going to look like because I don't know if there's going to be a strike. But what I can say is information will be coming in the next few days, and that will determine what the end of the quarter looks like. We've always had options in the past as to um, grade overrides and, and leverage and teachers working with principal to figure out what the end of the quarter is going to look like. But assume that just because uh, there may be a disruption, that does not mean that things come to a permanent, unchangeable uh, um, halt okay you will hear from us and uh, let's see you know when even if we do come back uh, on February 1st um, if something doesn't work as well as planned on the first day of course we will adapt right think of what remote learning looked like in the spring and what it looks like now we are way more prepared now for hybrid than we were for remote learning because we've spent so much time preparing for safety 
it's still not going to be perfect, right? It's not going to be perfect ever, and it's not going to be perfect on the first try. But, but safety being our biggest priority, if we lose some instructional minutes on the first couple of days, that's salvageable. Safety is the number one priority the moment we arrive. Um, and then, the, let's see, oh, uh, our, our language teachers asked that I, I remind students that no matter what happens in the next couple of days, do your Rosetta Stone. <laughs> do any work that's assigned, we ask teachers, please make sure you've posted something in your Google Classroom streams for students to see in case there is some form of a lockout. We want students to catch up on missing work, continue to work, and do your Rosetta Stone. Um, and the last thing I'll say here, um, oh, as I show you our master schedule in just a second, so I'm going to have to stop sharing one screen and then share another screen. So give me a second here. Um, is uh, We are in the middle of um, multiple pandemics, right? That's what I think we all need to remember is that we are in the middle of a uh, racial injustice pandemic that has been raging for 400 years, right? You've heard me say this before, I'm sure. We have a pandemic of COVID-19. We have the economic crisis that's going on right now. Our nation is healing from a very divisive election. So all of these things complicate everything that we are doing. And as I say to our staff, in spite of the, the challenges between CPS and CTU, we love all of you. We love your children. We have love in our hearts for, for every member of this community, whether they be staff, students, families, we know your hearts are in the right place. And all I ever ask is that we remember that as we craft emails to one another, as we get on the phone with one another, as we encounter one another, because really um, you know, your child coming to school physically or remotely, if there is a negative interaction, if there is something that rubs you the wrong way, you know, believe me, I want to hear about it. The teachers want to hear about it, but we can always approach each other with kindness and care and love, right? And, and this is more than ever with all the stress and anxiety going on in the world, we, we need to remember that this is, this is a time where everything is heightened and we want to make sure that we're um, respecting each other. Um, okay. Uh-oh. Oh, good. I thought I almost lost everybody. Okay, so I'm going to, uh-oh, did my screen just freeze? Okay, no, good. I can see everybody. Good. I am pulling up our master schedule right now just to show it to you really quickly, and then we will pause for questions. I just want people to see, if you're a visual learner, what our day looks like right now. So here we go. Here you can see, um, how about this? Uh, Ms. Ms. Jenkins, can you uh, or Rachel, I can see who's on my screen. Rachel Russ, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Yes? Yes, great. Okay, great. Thank you. So this is the master schedule. Um, I'm going to maximize it a little bit. Just I'll talk through it in like a few different waves. Um, I do need to be able to see at least a couple of people here. So I'm going to pull this open over here. Um, kinder and first grade, you can see. So off to the left here, just to orient you to this. Our times are in military times. So once you get past noon, just subtract 12 to know what time of the day you're at, right? So we've got, you know, the logistics of getting kids in the building, breakfast and read aloud, then literacy. Now it's a big chunk of time, but it's very likely that that's going to be half group hybrid, then half group at home or vice versa. So this is not the entire hour and a half together. It's going to be about 45 minutes, one group, and then 45 minutes, the other, right? Recess and lunch. Um, it might be some of the time simultaneous and then some of the time broken up, right? Um, recess and lunch at home is going to feel similar in person. It's going to feel pre-COVID a little bit, right? Where the kids are off their computer screens, they're interacting with one another, they're playing in some form. Then math, then language, then essentials, then science starting. This is at 3 p.m. The science social studies block is somewhat abbreviated. Um, and then the end of the day, the last half hour, we put recess snack. I mean, that's going to be recess snack packing the day up, talking through the end of the day, logistics, things like that. You see second and third, fourth grade here. You can kind of look at them as we go. Math, literacy, there's a giant block of literacy in fourth grade, but that's because in the other grades, you'll see that pop up again later. We just, as we have to fit essentials in and language in here and there, sometimes it interrupts what is being taught. So then it has, the rest of it has to fit in a different part of the day. So in second and third grade, you can see they have one of their core subjects, math or literacy. Then they have essentials when the teacher goes on their prep period where the essentials teacher comes to the room, recess, lunch, literacy, math afterwards, science and social studies for roughly a full hour, language class after that, small group reading and math groups, and that's the end of the day. 
fourth grade, you could see that there, literacy and then essentials before lunch, math is after lunch, science and social studies and language. And then the interesting thing is, um, I'll try and move this over a little bit in case my windows are covering this up. Um, in fifth through eighth grade, it's going to feel largely like it does now. Okay. In, in Wednesdays, everything is trimmed down in fifth through eighth grade, including language. They're only going to have about 35 minutes of it. Um, and, and I think in most grade levels, I, I can double check. Um, it's on a different tab. I just don't have it simplified like this. But look, look at fifth through eighth grade, right? They've got language like they do now in fifth and sixth grade. They've got, and then in seventh and eighth grade, they have it at 10, 10, like they do now. They have I, I believe it's the, I, I don't know it memorized off the top of my head, but I believe they have the exact same classes, the first hour in seventh and eighth grade, right after language in fifth, sixth, and then a different homeroom class or different core subject um, from 11 to 12 for everybody, then recess lunch. Then the big difference is instead of win time, like I mentioned earlier, that's had to have been cut out. So now while fifth and sixth grade have another core subject, um, seventh and eighth go to essentials when the teacher gets their prep, and then everybody has another core subject. And then um, fifth and sixth graders pack up uh, with their homeroom teacher. Their homeroom teacher is done for the day. They have their prep period for the rest of the day. The essentials teacher comes in, teaches them, and then dismisses them. Seventh and eighth graders have their last core subject. So don't take this as the final schedule. You will hear from your child's teacher. The timing of this is just so precise, right? I'm meeting with you tonight. Teachers have seen this as a preview. We're meeting with you tonight. I'm gonna pause for questions in about 10 seconds. And then we meet with teachers all throughout the rest of this week, unless there is a strike, where we're going to like nuance every aspect of the schedule and make sure we've thought through the administrator lens, the teacher lens, the parent lens, the student lens as much as possible. Um, and several teachers will be scheduling meetings or just um, sharing this information in whatever form they can before the end of the um, week. And that being said, um, I will stop sharing my screen. And I think Ms. Jenkins, unless I'm wrong, now it's time for questions. Um, and I will look for hands raised. I will keep an eye on the chat box and I'll continue to call on people as I see them. I don't actually see Ms. Jenkins, are you still on the call? I don't know if you, oh, I see you there, okay. I um, am, but my internet is, uh... Okay. Um, I see which door students will be exiting during dismissal. Um, Ms. Jenkins, did you, I, I have that on a spreadsheet. I don't know. I think that's something that we will definitely, um, like Ms. Jenkins, did you describe, like we're, we're planning on sending like a, like one page summary of what arrival and dismissal will look like for families, something like that, right? Oh, I know she's, I, I, will, I will answer these unless she jumps in. Ms. Jenkins, jump, jump in if you need to. Um, if you can, I know you're having some technical difficulties. Um, so yes, we will send like a one pager of what arrival and dismissal looks like. We also, I think as Ms. Jenkins said, we also got the feedback from some families that as, you know, these are hour and a half long meetings, right? And we don't expect families that, that are looking for specific information to know exactly where to look. So in addition to sending out the slide deck, we're going to make sure that there are notes either in the slide deck or tabulated somewhere in a master slide deck. So you know, like if you're looking for safety, here's where you go. If you're looking for building logistics, here's where you go um, with all the details right there. Maybe we'll put timestamps so that if you wanna reference the video and hear what's being said, you know exactly where to go in the video, okay? We wanna make sure that you have all the information you need. Uh, I see Rosalind Walker's asking if a family previously chose in person and have since changed their mind, how and when should the parent notify the school? Um, the, the most, raw basic way is email Ms. Saria and she can update it. But what I would prefer if you could do is fill out the survey that I sent out and I'll add it again tomorrow if I think I'll remember. Um, that survey, I mean, if you ever fill out a Google form, right, you know it timestamps, right? So the most recent submission, we've had some families submit it three or four times now. Remote pod A, then their, cha their situation changes. Now they, they really need pod B for some really important reason. And now they've decided, you know what, three days later, we're just gonna stay remote. That is perfectly fine. If you put it in that survey, we can look at your most recent response and make sure that we um, update things there. As you may know, we had at one point 65% of our families planning on turn, returning for hybrid. Um, and if you heard me in the um, LSC meeting last week, I pointed out that the numbers are now about 44, 45%. Um, but in those 45%, I'm, I'm confident that a, a significant, if not almost entirely all of those families 
are like there's there's some type of need right it's either a supervisory need a safety need a, a social emotional need um and so same with our families that are choosing to stay at home we know that there are very important needs health and safety things like that so once again without passing judgment on our teachers that are coming in or staying home we ask that all families you know we we respect the decisions of one another because there are various needs and we never know uh the exact situation that uh that other families are having um, i see ms jenkins is back with us um i am can you hear me yes absolutely i may i may leave again it's <laughs> internet is unreliable today i see um uh a parent is asking, do the remote kids get any social time with each other? So there's a couple uh, things. Ms. Yeah. Jenkins, did you want to talk about OST? Yes, so we did receive, so OST is out of school time, it's a grant. Uh, we did receive the OST grant um, and we're doing planning now. The goal would be to start um, February 22nd, I believe. Um, so Right now we have teachers um, and, and staff members volunteering to do mostly virtual classes, understandably so, but also there may be one or two in-person classes um, for certain grade levels. So we're still doing the planning and the staffing and all of that right now, but we will have um, an after school class or two um, different days of the week, but majority of it, 90% of it is our virtual classes. Okay. Um, what if an older sibling will be with a younger sibling, first grader and eighth grader? What will that look like? Um, yeah, we're, I think, I, I'm, I'm assuming that that question is about like different arrival times, right? Um, that, that's nothing new. Like there are a lot of schools in CPS right now that have different arrival times. Um, we will be ready for that. Uh, we have, for example, like two different staff members ready for each of the entry points of the building. So if a student gets to a certain location early, there's going to be someone there ready to receive them. But I will make sure that we've thought through like every angle of that of like, okay, so if a student arrives early here um, at this time, what does that look like? We, we, we go through when we plan these logistics, like every little minute of uh, people arriving at different times in different locations. Uh, but Ms. Jenkins, could you hear me okay? It seems like my computer was acting up a little bit. Um, I could not. I thought it was me. <laughs> okay, uh, that might have been me. Um, but no, I mean, the short answer is we will have for every minute of, of uh, arrival time after, as Ms. Jenkins said, 845 in the morning is the earliest that we plan on being on duty. We ask that families do not send their child early. But, um, you know, we do know that like an eighth grader with a first grader that that's going to be a realistic situation where that is the supervisor of that child. So we will be ready for those situations. Adults will be on hand in different locations ready for them. Um, I see the, the question of um, students that are pulled out, pulled out for um, a separate setting for uh, instruction. We've, we've built that in to the school day. So that's gonna feel very similar to like it does now. Like the teacher will arrive at the classroom door. The student or students will go with the teacher to a different classroom. That is allowable in the guidance um, because we have, uh, fortunately, once again, with so with enough of our families at home, there's very little opportunity for like cross potting to even happen with our pullout instruction. Um, a lot of our diverse learners are choosing to, to learn from home so the teachers can continue to teach them through the computer screen. But we have locations set up for all of our pullout instruction already. Um, what supplies do we bring? Great question. That's going to come from the teachers. Um, I would not worry about that too much in terms of uh, um, like, what do you need on day one? The, the first few days are really going to be all about logistics and, and getting students settled, trying to, to figure out what instruction is going to look like. If you want to know... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Ms. Jenkins. While you're on that, I think this is a good time to mention about How do I do first... this? Go ahead. Go ahead um, about that first week coming back, I think um, we're going to certainly have to, if you're at home, when students come into the building for school, we don't just jump Check. into teaching. Um, go ahead. Sorry. 
we don't just jump into teaching the first um, day. We have to talk about routines. We have to talk about expectations. We have to talk about logistics and teach students how to move throughout the building and interact throughout the building. So I think the first week that students come back, we want to make sure that if you're at home that um, you understand that there's going to be some things that have to be taught in school in order to even really start the learning that have to be taught before the learning starts. And so um, we'll have to set up a, a, a more unique schedule that first week. Um, and in some cases, maybe even the first, a little more into the second week as well. So but we'll communicate that with you as it comes to pass. I see a quick question here. Um, can you explain more about how language class will be taught? I mean, I, if I wasn't clear, the teacher will be in their own room, like probably in their own language classroom right now. The students will remain in their homeroom. The students never leave their homeroom except for like recess. Um, if the weather's decent and it will all be through a computer screen. So imagine like in a homeroom, the students from like Ms. Miller's kindergarten are all are from, and now she's only got, let's think about this a little more, right? There's only 10 students, right? In, in one of her pods and in any other pod in any other grade level, it's less than 10 students. It might be eight students, six students. They, those 10 students in Ms. Miller's homeroom in kindergarten, let's say two of them are Italian, two of them are French, three of them are Spanish and three of them are Mandarin. So, they are all in language class at the same time with headphones on looking at the computer. Now she's probably going to seat them strategically. So the Mandarin kids sit over here, things like that, but they are all in language class and Ms. Miller, it's not her lunch. It's not her prep period. She is still in the room, supervising the kids, checking in on them, making sure that they're focused. Um, but really they will be learning computer. They'll be learning language class like they are right now. And the biggest benefit is that the language teachers will not need to wear a mask because they will not be around children while they are teaching. Um, Ms. Jenkins, do the kids need to bring their own headphones? Um, you know, we didn't inventory the headphones, but in looking just kind of from my memory, um, it's not enough for every child. CPS sent headphones for teachers to use, not for students to use. So I do recommend that students bring their own headphones, but I can do a, a confirmation inventory tomorrow, but I don't think we have enough headphones to get yeah um i think ms jenkins is cutting out a little bit again um yes we will send the draft schedule to families uh i will send it as a draft though and then i may delete it if it's no longer relevant i will be checking in with our teachers to make updates as needed though um what will the kids do in recess outside and inside um, if it's outside, oh, Ms. Jenkins, do you want to describe? Sorry. Um, no, I mean, that's the thing is they still can't be, they, we still have to respect the social distancing. So it depends on the kids. It depends on, we're still working on, on coverage with, 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 uh, companies we're still working on. So honestly, uh, the big kids, they usually just run around anyway, but we won't be able to like share balls like we normally can. So it's not going to look like the regular recess. So mostly it'll be just more so relaxing or running around if they're outside or just kind of hanging out and talking if they're inside, maybe some games, some trivia games, things like that. But it won't be like your regular recess, obviously during COVID. Um, so, but we're, we'll, we'll work with the recess um, coverage team to kind of make those decisions. And obviously we'll try to make it fun as we can, but there are a lot of limitations and safety is gonna always come first. Sorry, I'm muted. Uh, we have a CPS Chromebook. Look, if your kid is coming back for hybrid, um, we have Chromebooks to swap out if your device is not working properly. If your child, if you have one of those old silver Samsungs, they're like, like nickel silver, please just feel free to come in and swap that out. I don't think they even work anymore. So if it is working for you. I don't know how. Um, we have newer devices. So please feel free to come swap it out if your device is not working properly. Uh, I'm, this is a question. I'm still not understanding if my son's teacher will be in the classroom. It seems to me that some teachers will have an opportunity to stay home at, uh, at home if they want. I want to make sure a teacher will be physically in the classroom. So look, I can't promise you a teacher will be in the classroom, right? That's a CPS citywide thing. I'm, I would not ask a teacher with underlying health conditions or a family member with underlying health conditions or 
childcare needs, like think of this, we have staff members, not just at LaSalle, at every school where they have childcare needs where their childcare will kick their child out if the teacher comes back to work because the parent is now exposed to COVID potentially at work Whereas at now they're not because they're working remotely. I'm not going to put a, fa a teacher in that situation if I can avoid it, right? I don't get a say so in whether the teachers have to report the, the classroom assistants and everything. I get a voice and I get to voice to the district. This, this staff member has health issues, their family member does, or they have childcare issues or some other type of extenuating circumstance. There will be an adult in the room with each child. I can't promise you that there will be a teacher in the room with each child. Will they be receiving instruction? Yes. Will they be, if they come in person, will they be able to interact with one another? Yes. Will they be doing activities of some kind and laughing and joking around? Yes, they will. It may not look exactly like what you thought, and you may be disappointed if you're expecting to see Ms. So-and-so, and then Ms. So-and-so is not in the building. She will still be teaching remotely is the goal for everybody. Um, let's see. Headphones wired or wireless type. Um, Mr. Graves, that was my question. This is yeah. Duffy, Duffy yes. Stewart. And okay. you're not, there should be, if it's not my son's teacher, Okay, there should be an adult in that classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, I, this is what I want to know. You're, you're saying you don't know if that teacher is coming back. Well, as a parent, I have the right to know if there's going to be an adult in that classroom. There will be absolutely an adult. We would not have children in a room with no adult, right? Like, okay. would, yeah. Yeah, but then you're saying, you also said in this conversation that they were going, that you know that all the teachers are coming back and that you're thinking you're going to have a teacher in the classroom. So you're kind of saying, talking out of both sides of your mouth here when you're saying that maybe it won't be exactly my son's teacher, but there will be somebody in there, but you don't even mm -hmm. know if that teacher is coming back. That's what's confusing to me. Right. I understand. Um, so we have, you know, if, if pre COVID, right, we have 18 homeroom teachers for 18 homeroom classes during COVID. If let's say teacher a, let's say your child's teacher, Duffy. I, 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 so Ms. Anderson. Okay. If Ms. Anderson does not return physically in person, the students from Ms. Anderson's class would either remain in the classroom by themselves with an adult, like a classroom assistant or a um, what's called a cadre, like a permanent substitute that's in our building every day, or they would be combined with another class. Um, we could re-roster them and put them with the other teacher, but we've decided as a staff that that's not something that we find uh, beneficial to students when they've gotten to know their teacher and their teacher knows them. So there are a few different scenarios. And the only reason I can't say exactly which staff members are coming back is A, this is a call with 100 people, oh, 89 people still on it. There were over 100 at one point and everyone has different teachers. I'm not gonna go like through the entire roster of teachers. Um, your teachers can tell you themselves if, they're, if a decision has been made, but I can tell you, and I don't wanna throw CPS under the bus here, but they're trying to work through the logistics of 50,000 employees of whether they are approved to telework or not. I've had, as I said earlier, I've talked to almost every single staff member. Um, every staff member is in one of a few situations absent a strike, right? If there's a strike, there's a strike. No one's coming back at, at first, at least. If there's not a strike, some staff members are saying, I, I don't have any health, any major health concerns. I, I get it. I'm coming back. It, it's, I don't love the idea. I might be terrified, but I'm coming back. Or I cannot come back because of my health concerns or my family member or child care needs or my status is in limbo and there are several staff members whose status is in limbo which is why i can't give a definitive answer as to which staff members are coming back yet okay but then in this meeting tonight you already said that it's you're not going to disrupt the the children's teacher who they have right now so but really if my son goes back to school his teacher isn't going to be in that classroom per se. You don't know that because you don't have the answer because you're trying to protect everybody's privacy. And, you know, for whatever reason, they want to stay home, they stay home. But regardless, then my child, and this is just an example that could be anybody else's and any other grade and any other student, that the teacher that they have right now might not physically be in that classroom. And that's what I'm asking about. And now you're saying that it is a possibility that there could be a sub teacher. So then 
my child won't know who that teacher is, which is fine, but I would like to know so I could prepare my son for that. Or sure. I'd like to know what is going to happen then. Is my, is my child in that classroom going to be watching Miss Anderson from a TV screen or something? I don't know what that looks like. Yeah. And so that's, that's the realistic possibility that at this point, we don't have any staff members who are planning on going out on leave, like not working, right? Every staff member at this point is still planning on working either in person or remotely. So it's a very realistic possibility for several teachers that the child will come to school, the teacher will not be physically present, the teacher will continue to teach them remotely as they have now, and it'll be a different adult in the classroom interacting with students at times while the teacher is still working from home interacting with the students. Now, when will I have a definitive answer for you? I can't say because I don't, I am not given that information yet. Approvals are still happening across the city, but I, I promise you, your child will not walk in on Monday morning and not know who's going to be there. Um, they'll, yeah, I'll either they tell will, you myself. They will not know who is their teacher then. They, they will know before Monday morning, one way or the other. Because if the teacher is planning on coming in, they will let you know I will be there. Or they will let you know that they're not going to be there or I would let you know. Some, some form of communication, which I can commit to, um, will come from either the teacher or myself. So, thank you. Um, other questions? Um, Someone was asking about the uh, oh. schedule and what was going to be sent out. Um, Claudia was asking that. So we are going to send out um, a couple things more individually from your from your class to you. So you'll get your your class information, your arrival location and times, and all those things sent out to you um, individually. Yeah, I um I saw someone ask to how many teachers are coming back. I, you know, I, I wish I could answer that. It's, it is literally a moving target, right? Um, there's, there's, uh, and, and honestly, CPS is moving the target on that. Um, as you may have seen in the email you just got, like staff members who had vulnerable family members were not approved until uh, over the weekend they asked principals, are you willing to approve these people? And I said, well, of course I am. I, I'm not going to risk a staff member's family member life to come back in the building um you know and then they ultimately make the decision they're just asking me for my input uh but the the, the guidance the the negotiations between cps and ctu keep changing so I, I don't have a number at this point um i see anjali has her hand up hi i had to drop off so i apologize if this question has already been asked um in case a child goes home with COVID-like symptoms, only to find out, oh, you know, it wasn't COVID, um, are, are, is CPS or is school requiring a negative COVID test as a proof for the child to come back? Or is it just, you know, given that you have to quarantine for 10 days or 15 days, regardless of whether you had it or you didn't have it? That's, that's a great question. Um, I think that the quarantine negates the need to show the test. Because it's, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Jenkins, right? It's a strict quarantine, right? Like, there's no exceptions to it. Like, well, if they feel better, right? Like, it's that period of time, right? Yeah, but then the, the test could override that if you realize it wasn't, but yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. So to clarify, if you get a negative test, you can come back to school the next day. Um, to my knowledge, but it also, it was some, there are li little things involved in that as well. Like they still have to be fever free for three days, even with that negative test. Um, you know, you understand. So there, it, yes, is the answer to the question in general, but there'll be some little things that may also override that. Got it. Thank you. Yep. And obviously if you communicate with us, we'll, we'll give you the details, right? Uh, like, more specific to your situation then, of course. Yeah, it's interesting how when we did NWA testing last week, the, um, the screener, the health screener, it was very revealing, right? Like we had a family that traveled and so they failed the health screener because the kid, the kid was healthy and fine, seemed presented healthy and fine, but failed the health screener because they had traveled, right? So, so much of it, it's like my go-to when I hear questions like that is, how would that trigger the health screener? And it, and it would, right? Because it would say like, it asks questions like, are you awaiting the results of, 
Um, do you have these symptoms? Things like that. So, and I'll put that, I'll try to remember to put that in the newsletter again tomorrow. I have, I created a one pager of all the questions that are in the health screener and I updated it recently because I realized that the version we do as a staff takes me literally less than one minute. The version you do for your child takes longer. It's frustrating. We learned that in WEA. We didn't realize that the kid one was so much longer than the adult one. So now we've updated that. So, um, I, you know, I get it. I see the questions coming in and, and I can just, I can sense from families that like, whether your child's teacher is coming back or not is, is a big deal. Um, I get that. It's, it's devastating to me that that is a reality. It's frustrating. And, and, I, and I'm not simplifying that at all. It, it is a reality that we have um, a deadly pandemic and staff that, like, we don't even know the true in level of infection, right? We don't know if, I know there's, there's these, the study, the CDC said schools should open and there's other health experts. Like I'm not weighing in on all the politics and the health uh, realities. Like that's, that's not even really a winnable argument in the eyes of those people, those of you on this call and those of you on our staff that have to come back, right? Ms. Jenkins and I have had to be back. We, we weren't given a say so in anything. So like we don't have a union, like we're not involved in that. Um, but I, I promise you that the way remote learning is going right now is, is the goal, is that we at least maintain the type of instruction that's in place. And if your child is planning on coming back, the enhancement will be in social interactions with each other. Their teacher may be present, but the instruction that their teacher present will be providing is not gonna look like it is before this. So I ask that we all be understanding that this is not gonna be um, you know, as great as we would hope if there were not a pandemic, right? So let's please be understanding that this is going to be a challenge and we're gonna, we're gonna try to iterate and do the best we can. Um, yeah, so I see, I have a question to my seventh grader who remote log in on Monday with the same schedules. Uh, technically, they will use the same one, they will use, they will go to the same place for their daily schedule on the website. I will be updating those over the weekend once we work through the nuances of the schedule this week. I'm, you know, like I said, every minute that passes, we're making more changes to all of the logistics. We're finalizing arrival, dismissal, breakfast, lunch procedures, getting them approved by the district, things like that. So it's probably going to take me Saturday into Sunday to update. I will probably do it myself. The, uh, the one page schedules on the website, but when your child logs in on Monday morning, the, um, uh, the master schedule that they use every day will be in the same place. It just will look a little bit different. And with that, it looks like we're almost at seven o'clock. I do see, um, uh, thank you to everyone on this call. Thank you to the comments that are in the box. Um, thanks to the, the kind words that people are putting in the box. I appreciate it myself. I know Ms. Jenkins does too. You know, none of you as parents signed up for this, right? To be your child's teacher at home all day, every day. None of our teachers uh, chose this profession in this way. And none of us as administrators uh, want to be stuck in the middle. I think that as, you know, if I can just say, this has been hard on all of us, right? And this has also um, really thrown a, a monkey wrench into the, the relationships that everyone has. I, I, all of you that are newer to our community, I, I've said to many of you, if, uh, if, if we were not in COVID and any of our first or eighth grade parents can attest to this, like we would have inter interacted with each other by now. We would have seen each other on the playgrounds. I, I'm, I'm very involved. Ms. Jenkins and I really want to have your children here and have you here um, and get to know you and, and do a lot, uh, you know, um, to, to build trust, build community, build a sense of a relationship as a, as a school. And all of that is, is, is disrupted and it's so sad. But in spite of all that, the kindness and love and, and care that everyone uh, is showing towards, I mean, towards Ms. Jenkins and I, but towards our staff and towards one another is really what I think keeps us all going. So thank you for all you do. Um, I will put the Q&A in the, uh, the documents I send out tomorrow. If you have more questions, we try to keep an eye on that and make sure we're answering questions. But you know, I, I always say there's a million things to answer. And even if we've answered 99% of them, there's always going to be a few things unanswered that we're going to try to get to. 
Um, thank you, everyone. And with that, I will go ahead and end the call. You know you can get a hold of us. Please usually start with your child's teacher or Ms. Saria, uh, but you can certainly reach out to Ms. Jenkins and I as well. We will answer as, every question before Monday, working through the weekend. Take care. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Bye.